Hi, my name is Kurt. I'm a fourth year student here at UM. Hi, I'm Gabby, another fourth year student, and we're going to talk to you today about um, what we're thinking about as the future of healthcare, and we want to focus on a uh, community focused, like community based uh, intervention and kind of create a system from the ground up, literally. So cute. I saw this online, I thought it was super sweet. Um, kind of like what uh, Haley and Lindsay were just talking about, about like what, what is an ideal health system and what are we missing from health and how that is really starting at the community level um, and not just at our own like, personal health level and how like, these things really can't be separated out. So I just thought this was really pretty because you can see public transit, lots of green space, it looks like a lot of like self-sufficient energy, um, no cars, walking space. Um, but that only happens in a city where you have public transit. That only happens in a city where there isn't a lot of like um, like violence, where there is a lot of walking paths that are accessible. So like, what do we need to get to this like beautiful little utopia that came up when I Googled utopia? <laughs> and isn't it fun that when you Google utopia, it's all about people and community and, and green energy and, and green space? Like that's what we all want. Okay. So community-focused health system, what does that look like? So we're kind of imagining like on like a more like practical level, like what does that look like? So we have a kind of like a image of a city here. So a series of small communities that are mixed residential and commercial spaces. They have a lot of green space, blue spaces, schools, um, and it has like your personal infrastructure that you interact with on like a daily basis. And in each of these small like neighborhoods, you would have some primary care physician access, and, and, and we're assuming that integrated medicine is a part of this primary care. But because your whole neighborhood is gonna see the same primary care office, it's gonna like likely require the single payer system. You're not gonna have like physician choice because um, it'll be in the neighborhood and it's not like the neighborhood that we built around insurance companies. Um, and then a bunch of these together make up a city. A city um, having a bunch of these little communities and then also with like one hospital and specialist system. So you have the, the kind of infrastructure and the health infrastructure and like regular personal life infrastructure that you interact with on a daily basis, and then like the more rare infrastructure that you don't need to like see every day a hospital or subspecialist. Okay, so part of the idea of our presentation is from the Blue Zones project. So this, for just background, they sort of looked at what communities live the longest, what are some of the unifying factors around them? They identified, you know, lots of social interactions, plant-based diet with, you know, maybe five percent meat, uh, lots of natural movement, strong faith. So a lot of different lifestyle modifications that are sort of cult cultivating a sense of health. So they did a project uh, where they inter made an intervention in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Um, and they found um, you know, these findings from their research and implemented them into the city. There was a $7.5 million savings in annual healthcare costs for employers. They added 2.9 years of lifespan within the first year of participating in the study. And the downtown streetscape was revitalized and increased uh, investment, increased tax revenue, increased uh, business. So uh, economically, it made sense too. I think you guys skipped the first slide. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, problems that we hope to address. I hope this still makes sense. I was like, we skipped something. Um, so some things that we were thinking about that we wanted like our infrastructure and like our community focused health system to address our access and not just like what we usually think of as cost, although that is also a huge point, but like geographic cost, you know, rural versus urban areas. Physician shortage, how, how you know, as physicians, we want to live in certain areas, do rural medicine, and then health literacy and like, the ability of people to interact with the healthcare system safely uh, and effectively. And over dependence on pharmaceuticals, overworked and burnt out physicians and other healthcare providers, cost and, and an excessive control by private insurance companies, and then a lack of emphasis on lifestyle, nutrition, community, and exercise. I hope this provides better context for where we are going with our community focus. Yeah, yeah. All right, so one of the large things that they did in the Blue Zone project was they updated the infrastructure to try and 
incentivize more public transit, more mobility, you know, walking places. So some of the uh, issues around this is that the cost of light rail, which is primarily what we use in the States, is infinitely more expensive than in Europe where it works. So in the US, it costs 100 to 700 million dollars per mile to install light rail. In France, they're able to achieve it for 40 million dollars per mile. So it's still a lot of money, but like factors less. Um, one thing that is underutilized is bus rapid transit. So the way that this works is it's sort of like a light rail where there's these designated bus lanes, there's no cars, um, it can only be a bus, it has priority over intersections, almost like you might imagine a railroad crossing, um, and it's way cheaper. The issue is, right now, people sort of view buses um, very negatively, you know, they're using the main streets, uh, it's not any faster because you could just take your car, you're dealing with the same traffic, but if you sort of adjusted it and made it more like a light rail, it would be a lot cheaper um, than utilizing this rail system. And you have a much greater return on investment because you're not putting down as much money. Uh, and then other options would be to increase natural movement. Uh, so one way that you do this would be to install separated bike lanes like we see here. So you have the main street where the cars are traveling, there's the parking lanes, then separated by some green spaces, and you have your bike lanes, and then the sidewalks. So this sort of keeps everybody protected. You're not worrying about the bikers being hit by a car, you're not worried about pedestrians being hit by a bicycle. Um, so this is a more simple way to sort of integrate this um, mobility here and just some sort of the health impacts. So uh, one thing I saw in the Blue Zones project, which is natural movement, you know, walking day to day, not necessarily going to the gym, not running a 5K, improved your health outcomes. And then there's been some studies, uh, shockingly not as many as you would actually expect, but uh, just your daily walking distance improves BMI, blood glucose, and your CBD risk. So we, uh, in a previous week, had an entire presentation on this topic, so we're not going to go into it so in depth, but we do think that it's a really important component of building a healthy community and building a healthy health system. So um, green spaces in third places, so green, we're talking about green spaces and blue spaces. These are areas of like nature, plants, um, water features, and these can be natural or man-made. Um, so it's important if you think about, oh, well, this is already built like this. We can get rid of a parking lot. You can put a park in there, um, and that these this is really um, supported by literature. So, one study is like the relationship between green and blue spaces with mental and physical health. It's a systematic review, um, and it showed that there's a lot of reductions in the risk of developing long-term health conditions, uh, specifically in, in this um, systematic review: diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and schizophrenia. Third places are places in our communities that aren't your work, your school, or your home. There are places where you have no obligation to be, but you're still able to hang out there, have social interactions there, or not, just like be out outside of your house. Um, but they allow for a sense of community. There's a study about, uh, there are lots of different studies on this, so this was pulled, this section is pulled from like, um, um, like a systematic review, but some like, great evidence that comes out of the increased amount of third spaces is that it increases neighborhood diversity and cohesion. It like provides opportunities for people to improve like their well-being, their well-being by like, being out in the community. It increases, it, and it's the people who have the best um, like protective features by third spaces are people who would be otherwise lonely, vulnerable at home. Um, so it has the best effects on people who are vulnerable to social isolation. And, and puts them in opportunities to be around others without any like expectations. Okay, so now some considerations around community planning. So this would likely be easier to implement in a small to medium sized city, you know, in Miami, New York, it's so built up, it's going to be sort of challenging to find the space to do these things um, and remove the already existing infrastructure. Um, another consideration is it can't be in too small of a city. So, the average hospital in the U.S. Um, has one, for every 1,000 population, you have 2.38 hospital beds. The average hospital has about 130 beds, so you need a city of around, uh, around 50,000 people to sort of make it make sense to have a hospital here. Um, the town where I grew up was 30,000 people. We had a hospital. It basically slowly withered away and died. It didn't have enough patients to really accommodate specialists. People were going to these tertiary uh, centers rather than going to our local community hospital. 
So you really do need a larger population to sort of support this kind of healthcare. Um, interestingly, the majority of pedestrians willing to walk uh, less, they're willing to walk less than half a mile to light transit. So if you have to walk miles to the nearest train station, people aren't going to do it, they're going to drive. Um, so you're going to need to have more frequent, uh, smaller sort of scale here. Uh, and then cyclists are willing to bike substantially greater distances, either to just go from point to B or to access public transit. So sort of utilizing these protected bike lanes um, would be a much more cost-effective way of doing this than increasing, you know, trains, that kind of stuff. And then uh, mixed use of zoning uh, is one thing that really improves walkability in a city. People are more likely to walk if, you know, they live near where they shop and where they work. And shorter distances to parks increases walkability. And then the money saved on healthcare costs and the economic development from this would be a potential funding source to fund these projects. Uh, I did see many different sort of projects where uh, increasing you know, bike lanes like this, like I described, having a biking trail actually improves the um, property value of properties within one block. It increases business. Uh, they usually find that you know, it's a net positive economic investment rather than a drain. Uh, so the money saved and the money increased could help fund uh, these kind of interventions. So some like potential roadblocks is of course like we're talking about tearing down the world and rebuilding it. Um, <laughs> so like, displaced populations while rebuilding these communities, like what's going to happen to people in the meantime um, while these areas are being built up again. Um, and of course costs, which Kirk addressed, addressed a bit. Um, but you know, if we're talking about like massive infrastructure overhaul, it's obviously not going to be easy. And uh, a lack of personal choice of healthcare providers. Like I think that people are kind of like, do have um, concerns about that. Like they love their healthcare providers, um, but we're hoping that like the ease of access and the quality of healthcare providers, and like the idea of, the, of that particular healthcare provider being for the community, aware of the community, the same exposures, the same parks, the same community events, like will be like, an, enough of an, like, an attractive um, trade-off. Um, physicians have to agree to live here. Like, uh, if we're talking about one physician per like large neighborhood, then you have to have these physicians, but I think that the idea is that these communities are so like, attractive and lovely to be in that it would be something great to do. Um, and then some of them will live in like the hospital districts. Um, and then of course, like there's a reason why we don't have a single payer healthcare system in this country. Um, so there's like that whole, big roadblock to, uh, to surpass, and uh, we're probably like the beginning of that, but I think that to me that's important to note is that like our healthcare is in like a huge like, disarray currently, like this isn't, I think there's a difference between like trying to make a big change for no reason, but in this case we're trying, we have to make a big change because like we're a critically ill population with a healthcare system that is continuously failing many people. So it's like, okay, yeah, it's really drastic, but people want to be well. And I would hope that there would be enough people who are interested in this. Like what Kerr was saying about the Blue Zone projects, like there's evidence that rebuilding and kind of creating a community-based infrastructure for health is gonna be is effective. So if people want to be well, and if our powers that be and our politicians want a well country, okay. like there has to be a huge changes made. That's awesome. Excellent. Great job. Yeah, that's an interesting 